Thank Hello you. and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 9th of May 2022. Uh, I am joined as ever by my marvellous co-host, magnificent co-host, Mr. Andy Brockman. And uh, we are almost a year into doing weekly Watching Briefs, Mr. Brockman. We're a few days off a year of Watching Brief every week. As opposed to the year that people watching Watching Brief think the show actually takes to... We're not very good at keeping to time sometimes, are we? No, no, we're not, no. And that's one of the benefits we've decided of Zoom recently changing their um, limitless two-way call uh, time limit to 40 minutes, is at the very least we might, Andy and I, be able to try and be somewhat more disciplined in our weekly offering. Um, Start the stopwatch. Yeah, exactly. I literally have, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> so this this week we have um, a selection of things for you. First of all, of course, the link of the week, uh, as ever at the moment, is the Disasters Emergency Committee, um, linked with ongoing uh, conflict, struggle and suffering in Ukraine in particular. Uh, but also as well, we want to highlight the great work being done by Neil Redfern, who's decided to walk the wall, Hadrian's Wall, um, at the end of which I live. Um, in support of uh, of Ukraine, walking the wall in support of Ukraine on just giving, um, so far has raised one thousand eight hundred and fifteen pounds. I think we'll probably uh, donate something from watching brief uh, to to the to the t tally as well, and um, and a great deal of uh, of very supportive comments as well. People uh, praising the effort and the focus on. Uh, on raising money for a good cause so um that's a, that's a, 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 a something that's come about uh, well I, I only noticed it this week it, it might have been going for a little bit longer than that um but that's the link uh, down there as well and also we have a follow-up following f on from last week on the um victorian uh bridge infilling issue with the, from the hre that's right um new viewers start here uh there's a, an old railway bridge at Great Musgrave in Cumbria, mm. which National Highways have infilled with concrete uh, as part of a programme which hasn't been announced, hasn't been widely discussed. It's been done at a, apparently uh, at a local level, but it has national implications in terms of potential for green highways and things mm. like that, which have been blocked off by basically infilling these bridges so, so they don't have to do maintenance and inspection. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that effectively they didn't have planning permission. Hmm. Uh, to do a to infill a bridge at Great Musgrave in the Lake District, and they are now applying for retrospective planning permission um, after they poured a thousand tons of concrete into the into the bridge arch. And it looks um, awful as well. It, it does. Looks, it looks it like so, it looks like expanded foam. They haven't even smoothed off the surface. Um, yeah, but apparently that, the, that's the, right. Cumbrian Council, the Cum, uh, the, uh, the local um, authorities. Is it, uh, it's, it's Eden District Council. Eden fact. District Council. Okay. Oh, I see. So it's yeah. a council in Cumbria, Cumbrian, a yes. Cumbrian council uh, yes. may look to reverse uh, this concrete um, uh, infill. But how practical is that? I mean, we've heard of, of companies, for example, in Australia having to rebuild caves that they've exploded. I mean, yeah, uh, it is. This realistically, this is going to be a, a, a. It's going to be very hard, or at least very expensive, to do this properly if they do have to take it. In away. in in the end, it comes down to a legal process and potentially what a judge feels is reasonable and proportionate. Yeah. Um, the coverage in the Guardian, um, which I'm looking at at the moment, suggests that the cost of removing the infill and remedial work is approaching half a million pounds. Wow. Yeah. Planning. Planning is important. Um, and of course, we'll come on to planning in a moment in this watching brief. We will indeed. And I think it's worth saying as well that the um, the planning application for retrospective planning and permission is currently with Eden District Council. Um, the current reporting is that there are almost 800 objections to the infilling and only nine expressions of support, presumably the manager of the scheme at National Highways and probably eight members of their family. Yeah, yeah, and also um, uh, people who are uh, uh, um, masochistic and like rolling down cheese grater textures in the buff at midnight. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't visit those kind of websites, Mark. I, I know nothing about that kind of thing. Do you know what? While we're on the topic, cheese racing is fantastic, and this yes. isn't rolling cheese down a hill. 
Oh, not like the Shrove Tuesday thing. No, no, no. No, no. Oh, right. It's a it's a whole website where people take you know the plastic cheese in squares and throw them onto barbecues, and you race with each other with your different squares to see which one will pop first because obviously the cheese boils and then it's gas expands. It's a strange pastime, but you'd be surprised the websites I've visited, um, or not. I don't know. <laughs> I think we be- I think we better move on to the next topic. Look, uh, come on, somebody somebody in the House of Commons. <laughs> Did a search for tractors and look what happened to them. That's true. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, next we have um, another little headline to take a look at um, from BBC News. Heather Slaw Corn Mill uh, makes garden millstone appeal. This is Heather Slaw, Heather Slaw Corn Mill, a flour mill in Northumberland that's on the hunt for a not easy to find replacement millstone. Um, these are huge chunks of stone and the quality of the stone is very important because it has to be quite a dense stone so as not to introduce um, fragments of stone into ground grit you know, into the mill and into the, the flour that people then might you know break a tooth on for example um, but also as well uh, it, it's the size and diameter of the stone it's the way that they've been cut they were relatively common when people were frequently um, or more frequently milling across the country they sort of started to go out of local fashion in the sort of the 70s i think 60s and 70s they said that they ended up that was their their the the last hurrah um and they've ended up in lots of people's gardens so um this in this instance uh what they're what they're suggesting is that millstones are often made from a type of flint that's found in france and belgium so they would have been imported and someone may well have one that's going to be perfect for the heather slaw mill uh, as a replacement stone sitting in the at the bottom of their garden and i imagine uh, there might be some bags of flour in in it for them, if they donate the, the millstone. I mean, at the well, very baking, least, I, bread I'd making, yeah, yeah, baking, bread making is a re- really popular hobby at the moment. So I think it's a good quid pro, quid pro quo there. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and also, uh, we we finally have uh, in our sort of links to to take a look at, um, and again from BBC News, uh, Ukrainian refugees in Wales. Uh, uh, are getting free bus travel and access to Kadu sites. Kadu being the uh, the Welsh equivalent of of uh, historic England, and um, they run, you know, like they used to. Well, not used to. They still run the castle up the road from where I grew up uh, in uh, Rhithlan, uh, Conway, um, Harlech, um, Bamaris, all these places. Um, it's a fantastic organisation to be a member of, and it is uh, hopefully not only going to be good for mental health getting into the countryside seeing historic sites um for for these for these people who who are undoubtedly in need of respite but also as well they get to learn a little bit about the history of the place where they are taking refuge so if you've turned up in wales and you see a castle on the horizon if it's kadu then um you may well if you are a, a refugee uh, get access to those sites and um that's a really nice well it's a, yeah it's a I, I use the word nice in the nicest way, development. It's a, it's a very pleasant development, and it's a very welcome one. I, I, I'd like to just while we just finishing off on on, the, on this particular item, I, I'd like um, to to quote the um, deputy minister for arts and sports uh, of the Welsh Assembly, mm-hmm. SNF, uh, Don Bowden, um, who said, "I'm delighted to see Cadu playing its part in showing what being a nation of sanctuary means." Yeah. Um, I think compare and contrast with some of the comments that are made about refugees, uh, perhaps the other side of the border from Mm -hmm. politicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, next, uh, in terms of our sort of more formal media topics and subjects, we sort of, we have a, an amuse bouche here that uh, Andy's introduced, um, hinting at an upcoming planned special that we're doing on uh, climate and archaeology. Uh, and this is, well, it's, it's a weird one. Uh, no telling what we'll find. Bodies in Lake Mead spark mob speculation. Crikey, this sounds dramatic, Andy. This is a story about Lake Mead uh, near Las Vegas, which has been shrinking. And it is uh, expected to reveal... Uh, certain activities of the Las Vegas mob. Hmm. Um, and we're not talking about water yeah, skiing. Uh, no, and we're not talking about Jimmy Hoffa either. He's meant to be under a, uh, I think it was a, 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 you know, a, a sports stadium. Uh, yeah, a sports stadium or something like that. Um, no, the, 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 uh, 
basically it's a, it's a um lake mead has, has dropped by 52 meters since 1983 it's the it's the lake that supplies the water to um las vegas and, yeah. uh, and other er- areas in uh, in nevada um it basically is down about 30 percent of its capacity and it is starting to reveal um or potentially reveal people who were sort of disappeared mm. um pe- uh, you know the um people who were who the, were sleeping with the fishes as they say absolutely <laughs> um for example um the uh weekend boaters spotted the decomposed body of a man in a rusty barrel stuck in the mud of the newly exposed shoreline the corpse Eesh. has been identified Yep, the corpse has not been identified, but Las Vegas police say he'd been shot probably between the mid 1970s and mid 1980s, according to the shoes found with him. Um, surprisingly or not, the death is being investigated as a homicide. Yeah, but, but yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. look, the, uh, the, 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 reason, uh, the reason I wanted to raise this really is, is, is two reasons. Well, I th- first of all, it's a really interesting piece of modern history, modern folklore coming together yeah. with climate change, really. Yeah. Um, but also, the, when I read the story, I immediately thought of the uh, arguments that, that there have been in the world of archaeology since uh, the late 1940s, early 1950s, when the Danish bog bodies uh, mm. were first described by uh, Globe and, and, and then others, yeah. um, you know, as to whether they're human sacrifices or whether they're criminals who were being executed. Mm-hmm. Um, they were turning up um, preserved in the um in bogs where they you know it had never been intended that they see the light of day again yeah um particularly if they were deposited there you know deliberately so well, we've well, got an echo well, here of you well, know, but, things but, that were going well, on in prehistory perhaps well absolutely but also what's interesting about bog bodies is that they, it um often they're very seemingly very well cared for prior to being deposited they have mm. their nails trimmed they have a relatively hearty meal you know hairs cut all this kind of thing um it could be uh, that that we're seeing um, also regicide. That was one of my favourite options for um, uh, for the bog bodies. Is this idea of you you kill your or sacrifice your leader to get a better harvest or something? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting comparison. I mean, obviously, no one was was stuffed into a barrel in the Iron Age, though. Um, crikey! No, um, but there are yeah, no, but there are like, there are you know, suggestions that some people maybe were staked down in the in the bogs and things like that. So yeah, yeah there, there are, yeah. Um, there, there, there's well, behaviour, there's there, there's recordable behaviour going on in both instances, uh, what, even what, if the motivations are different. What do you make? Because obviously, the motivation here is is to is to disappear. Someone is to get rid of and also get rid of the evidence of that disappearance. Yeah. What do you make of the Iron Age notion, or the notion possibly in the Iron Age that people had observed natural uh, depositions so maybe a sheep died fell in and didn't rot or you know or a bird mm. or something and they went oh this is this is a, a, a portal this is a way of preserving something you know f- f- for the hereafter do, do you think that's a possibility i'm not enough of a specialist in nine age religion to make a call on that really i, mm. I just think that um there you know potentially there are many reasons uh and sometimes interlocking reasons for you know, human behaviours de- mm. uh, and, and, and the development of you know, human behaviours over, over over time and so on. So, yeah, it, you know, um, um, we know people, you know, people have certainly observed their environment and, and, yeah. and taken note of what's going on in the same way that, you know, now people are observing the environment, observing the shrinking of lakes and it's driving behaviour in terms of, you know, are, are, are we, uh, we, 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 we switch to unleaded fuel, we mm. are using... Uh, you know less fossil fuels now to try and drive down you know th- these things are all uh, are interlinked Cult- cultures are complicated and the, and the inferences can be many and varied and sometimes contradictory that was a good answer i mean i don't know would have would have sufficed but fair enough <laughs> <laughs> now um uh Next, come on, come on. We're, 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 we're academics. We're meant to go around the houses before we make a conclusion, and which which side of the fence we're going to put our, our, our legs. Fair point, and you and you ended up making a beautiful observation as well, which was thank what, you. Um, speaking of beautiful observations, um, next we have the story. Uh, this is uh, from Sky Group. Um, Sky Arts and Prince Charles himself have set out to reinvigorate heritage crafts in a brand new series. The Prince's Master Crafters, uh, colon, the next generation. Um, 
this looks intriguing and it also ties in with uh, um, something that, that we noticed um, in recent days uh, that the applications have opened up in in Ireland for uh, an all Ireland heritage skills program um this 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 is this is also probably possibly tied in with things like carbon footprint and notions of the environment and our impact on on where we source materials and and composite items that other people make uh did you think that uh that, that we may be seeing the the beginning of a new a new approach and maybe even a new arts and crafts movement possibly well it's i mean it, it, it's certainly possible but actually at the root of this i think uh, uh, and this sort of ties in a little bit with the story we were talking about earlier about the uh, search for a millstone, a replacement millstone. Mm. Um, it, a lot of uh, heritage work these days is about conservation of buildings, the restoration of buildings and so on. And very often we're talking about buildings. Uh, you only have to think of the, the number of crafts, for example, that are involved in uh, even just stabilising, let alone restoring our medieval cathedrals. Uh, yes. Look at what's going. Look, look at what's going on in, in, in Notre Dame at the moment. Which, yeah. which, you know, we've also um, spoken about in the past. Mm. Um, you, uh, you are dealing with crafts, uh, stone masonry, make you know, uh, lime mortars, leaded glass, painted glass, um, uh, coloured glass. Uh, oak carpentry green mm. oak carpentry things that aren't part and parcel of the modern construction industry yeah and so lime if you're washes, going to, this kind of thing yeah mm. absolutely lime li exactly lime wash based paints mm. with, uh, with, uh, with, with mm. wattle and daub all, yeah. all of those things are things that people need to be trained in to keep uh, to, to enable those uh, you know those kind of restorations to to, to happen yeah or reconstructions you know we we've we seen um you know the the, the Famously, places like Butser, Butser Farm in Hampshire, uh, with the, you know, the, where they've reconstructed. Uh, I think they've now got buildings running roughly from uh, prehistory through the Iron Age into the Roman period and Saxon period. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, um, all using um, as, as near as is identifiable the, pro the the proper construction techniques and materials to show how those buildings would behave in real life when they were when they were new. Yeah. Um, you know, so that, that there's an archaeological reason for keeping those crafts alive, and as a, a, and obviously a, a conservation drive, mm. which is more what this this new series is about, and certainly the new Sky series. Um, well, it's, well, it's where, where that, that last year alone in the UK, four heritage crafts were declared extinct, and a further fifty six were declared critically endangered. Yeah, uh, the Princess Foundation adv advocates for the preservation of heritage craft skills through a vast array of education and training programs, and it runs sites across the UK, including at its Ayrshire he headquarters, uh, Dumfries House. Uh, and interestingly, they've broken it down into episodes, haven't they? So, episode one is wood carving, episode two is stained glass, uh, then weaving, then black smithery blacksmithing uh stone carving um par par parjetting parjetting yeah what's parjetting um it's a decorative art using natural materials like uh, leaves and nuts and that kind of thing fascinating um, and then there's a grand finale when yeah. they fight to the death that's right yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. They 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 they, they throw nuts and chisels and things at yeah. each other to yeah. decide who's the last one standing. No, 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 no that's uh, that, that's worldwide WWF, isn't it? Yeah. Um, anyway, no. Um, look, uh, they have clearly chosen some uh, crafts that are, are, are the most publicly approachable, the most televisable. Yeah. Um, the most immediately understandable. Mm. Uh, yeah, the, having a, a, a Watland Daub competition probably wouldn't be as visually interesting as you know, watching people with a stain uh, an, a stained glass assignment. Yeah, um, or intricate or, or stone carving. Wood, yeah, or that's right. Carving. That's right. But look, I mean, yeah, they're they're raising consciousness about the issue of these lost crafts. If it drive, you know, if it inspires anybody to take up those crafts, particularly young people to take up a potential career in those crafts where actually you know there, there's probably if, if you're in a high demand craft where there's relatively few people in it it might be a good thing to get into in terms of job security that you know yeah. given, given that you know major projects in for example a cathedral if you're a stonemason you, you could be employed for years 
Um, Absolutely. So well, actually, in, in and around um, York Minster, I think I think they're mm. still undergoing a building, a, a project mm. of rebuilding portions of the building, um, resurfacing, certainly redetailing. Uh, people not only uh, are, are skilled and employed to do it, but also actually it's so interesting to watch that, that, that they have the workshop facing the public. People can sort of walk past and see people doing doing their work. Um, yeah. The programme... Um, the skills program in Ireland, um, sorry, in Northern Ireland, but benefiting both the Republic and Northern Ireland, uh, is also developed by the uh, Princess Foundation in partnership with the Heritage Council uh, in the Republic of Ireland and the Historic Division of Northern Ireland's Department of Communities. So, all all it's all good. It's it, yeah, very very good ideas here. And I think it's worth adding as well that um, Historic England have also uh, mounted similar programs in the last few years uh, to mm. try and get people in to these historic craft careers again because you know with the number of sites that are maintained by his you know historic england and english heritage mm. um there is a d th th these skills are in demand yeah so that's a positive uh and potentially we have another positive that's come about uh, in the past uh, week or so at the beginning of the week we should say or i should say we uh we we laid out an agenda uh and thought that was it for the week and then we realized <laughs> that something might be happening and and it did happen so we had to throw out the agenda yesterday and start again more or less because of the details that are coming out now of the um so-called leveling up and regeneration bill um i saw a cartoon i think that you shared on twitter about this andy where uh a, a guy comes home from having popped to the shops or something he's in his car and there's someone waiting for them on the driveway and to say uh, bad news, your neighbours have voted to demolish your house. <laughs> and the house is just in rubble uh, behind him. Um, it, what, what's going on? Are, are we about to have to you know, be very friendly to our neighbours, lest our house get blown up? Um, well, actually, I'll just explain that, that that particular cartoon, it's by the brilliant cartoonist Matt, who um, does mm -hmm. a, a, mm -hmm. a daily cartoon for The Telegraph. Mm -hmm. um, and usually absolutely nails a particular news story of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and this was about the uh, the Queen's speech, and in particular, the inclusion in the Queen's speech of what's called the levelling up bill. Mm. Um, the levelling up bill has been long promised and delayed. Um, at least uh, a planning bill has been long promised and delayed and now the planning bill has actually been subsumed into the quotes leveling up bill which is being steered by uh, cabinet minister michael gove which itself uh, arguably is a rebaking of the northern powerhouse as well that but, look um, we'll, we'll come on to the politics of this in, yeah. a, in a minute but the, the, the headline for archaeologists is that in a section, a separate section, actually on heritage, in the levelling up bill, mm. um, there are a number of um, commitments that the government makes to turn into law, the most important of which is that uh, it, it is to put historic environment records, HERs, on a statutory basis. Yes. That means that the relevant local authorities must maintain an up-to-date historical environment record that can be referred to in planning applications yeah um it's absolutely crucial that when somebody puts in a planning application the environmental and historic environment context is part of the decision making process mm -hmm. so that for example if in the 19th century somebody discovered a mosaic floor right in the middle of where somebody wants to build a housing estate that can be factored into the discussions and decisions can be made about uh, preservation in situ or excavation, uh, or, or anything else in between. Well, uh, and so, but also crucially, it means that you're not just relying on someone going. Oh, I think I seem to recall that there's something over there. I'm not quite sure precisely. what it is, but it's there-ish. <laughs> like you know, whereas actually, if you have this stuff in a record, it can be referred to, and plans can be made to either build around or build somewhere else, or you know, accordingly, uh, essentially, with good information. Yeah. Ab absolutely right. Um, mm. And it has to be said as well, this is a win for the archaeology sector, which has been arguing for this for years. Yeah. Um, now, I talked about politics earlier. Um, people might remember, I think we talked about it at the time, but uh, back last year, a parliamentary select committee reported uh, to the government and argued that 
statutory HERs should become a matter of law. Mm -hmm. um, so the government can say that it's actually responding to the select committee. The select committee was responding to evidence that it had taken from organisations, archaeological organisations, Historic England and so on. So after many, many years of lobbying and then that select committee report last year, this is finally in, uh, appeared in a in a government bill. Yeah. Um, now, uh, there are other um, there are a few other um uh, sections of the bill which are interesting. One, for example, um, enables uh, local authorities to issue a stop notice if it, uh, if it believes that inappropriate work is being done or about to be done on a historical asset. Yeah, so, um, so, so if someone has taken a digger onto the field where there may be a mosaic in the middle of it and is about to punch through it, then um then some people might be able to request it, 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 it's it, it's more to do with buildings actually we've talked to, i think we talked about the um the the pub that was demolished in north london before uh, as it was about yeah. to be um, yeah. listed and, and, and so on uh, so it's and then at actually like, actually sorry so on, on the note of the victorian bridges actually that company was ordered to rebuild it wasn't it uh, brick for brick it was indeed yeah. absolutely mm. the, 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 and, and there's, there's a, a similar case going forward in brighton at the moment mm. where the um, council is taking um, uh, is trying to deal with a um, unauthorized work by a, a, um, a building so it, owner again, so is, again it's another it's another pub is there an argument here then that this sort of measure as opposed to just being because some people said it's sort of it's codified nimbyism not in my backyard kind of mm. stuff but is, is there an argument to be made here that actually it prevents mistakes happening and developers having to pay millions of pounds for a brick by brick reconstruction of a victorian or georgian pub or something yeah well look, in, in those circumstances we're by and large talking about bad actors yeah and um oh uh, okay. it, it, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so but certainly the uh, the argument from the archaeological sector for uh, as long as there's been development and developer funded archaeology is that uh, a small investment in archaeology ahead of time saves a great deal more money um, when somebody lands into a Roman villa without knowing it was there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, that that's 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 the argument. Um, the, 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 the NIMBYism, I think, I mean, it, it, it was one of the more eye catching um clauses in the bill which appears to suggest that there, there could be local referendums even sort of street neighbor referendums so mm. for example uh, we live in the same street i want to put in a loft extent um you know a loft extension mm. or a granny flat and um you and you can get together with the rest of the street and oppose it mm. um now a lot of people are tr be treating that with a great deal of skepticism Mm. Um, the other thing uh, that has to be said about the bill is that it appear, the government appears to have dropped its housing targets, which were causing huge problems, particularly in the south of England, in, in, in safe conservative seats, mm -hmm. um, where uh, local voters appear to have been extremely concerned that green spaces, green belt, um, was going to be infill with inappropriately large housing developments by the big housing um, housing developers like Wimpies mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and of course, that's that's led to some, you know, uh, you know pe tugging of collars and, and, and nerve anxiousness on the part of uh, Tory members of parliament because they're seeing it seen as being vulnerable to being usurped by people from Lib Lib Dem. Well, they're not just seen as being. I think I think that they are vulnerable to be to, to, to those kind of issues. Um, the, the case that's always quoted at the moment is the Chesham and Amersham by-election yeah. last year, mm. where the Liberal Democrats took what had previously been a safe Tory seat, mm. and, what, and planning uh, local planning was one of the major issues on local, the doorstep. On, on, on the uh, doorstep during, during yeah. that during that during that by-election, apparently. So, so just to be clear, then uh, the the stop that can occur on on uh, on heritage uh, planning and building grounds isn't something that local people actually vote on. Then that that's that's a that's a local authority issue connected with data, which will be in things like HERs. That yeah, uh, uh, and don't forget under the under the current planning system, this doesn't appear to change that. Um, local authorities still take decisions; they still consult with their local community and anybody who has a particular um, position for or against a particular development can make a submission to the planning process. Yeah, uh, I'm involved in a planning issue at the moment where um, you know, to do with a, a Grade Two listed pub, hmm. um, and um, so you know that 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 appears to be all still there. Mm. Um, what does appear to have gone, for example, is the um, 
presumption of planning consent and zonal planning issues, w- w- which were in the original drafts of the of the planning bill that's now yeah. been dropped. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot. It's a lot less um, frightening to the environmental and heritage forces. Okay. What, 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 what's come up now? Um, the, the only um, thing you know, it has to be said here that, that the devils are always in the detail. Um, the issue of uh, statutory HERs raises an issue of resources, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, particularly as we're currently in the middle of what is uh, called the, the you know the cost of living crisis. Or well, in the uh, foot, infl- foothills of it, I think possibly. Absolutely, mm. ab- absolutely, with, with inflation rising and costs mm. for energy costs rising and so on. Um, so uh, whether local authorities will have the resources to do this, if it goes through, if it becomes law. Um, there's also a clause that um, requires organisations like Historic England to assist in developing uh, HERs. And again, that's an issue of, raises an issue of resources for Historic England. If suddenly dozens of local authorities are wanting to update their HERs and bring them up to speed and bring them online and, and, and so on and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, finally, I, I, I'd... Um, like to just add one caveat. Um, the it's a headline um, from a uh, an organisation called the Institute for Government, highly respected think tank uh, that looks at issues of governance and um, public policy and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a, a, a commentator called Bronwyn Maddox, uh, again highly respected, and her response to the Queen's speech, her analysis of the Queen's speech, is that it promises too much, too late. And she says the striking point about the legislative programme the government set out in the Queen's speech was its scale. In sheer number, this is more than could be reasonably expected to deliver, even if many bills were not controversial, and they will be. For this reason, it reads like a manifesto aimed at the party base more than a realistic programme. Right, yeah. In other words, uh, uh, this could get quite feisty in Parliament, especially given some of the other bills that are there. Mm -hmm. And... um, even though it's here in in draft, it may not finally make it onto the statute book, or yeah. at least not in the form that it is now. So, potentially, a whole fleet of things that are potentially quite good. Uh, I'm sort of tiptoeing up to being positive about this, in so much as uh, these are things that that were recommended in that select committee report. The timing of implementation, or at least timing of talking about implementing, uh, is potentially very politically expedient, particularly for those MPs in the South uh, whose uh, constituents are concerned about these sorts of planning issues and would love to have a vote on on certain issues. But we shouldn't necessarily... uh, be too cynical about it is because it's been implemented for a reason that's expedient for the party that's in government of course that's going to happen that's what almost always happens so uh potentially good stuff and stuff that archaeologists have been discussing and arguing for for a long time including lobbying bodies such as cifa fame and others so um yeah uh, although not an un- unalloyed good potentially a little flavor of of a question mark there with regards to actual democracy and protest you can have a vote but you can't make your voice heard Potentially. Um, Now, in terms of making our voices heard, though, uh, this week is actually Mental Health Awareness Week. And we wanted to end on a note of uh, of highlighting that, but also uh, highlighting a couple of of um, of resources that that that, that we've spotted specifically uh, in the heritage and archaeology sector. And uh, archaeologists, as we've talked about in previous watching briefs, have been identified as being vulnerable to issues of depression of of um for example uh, uh loneliness um uh, which uh, i think you were saying is actually the theme of this year's uh mental health awareness week is loneliness that's right it's what yes it's what it's one of the underlying themes certainly yeah, but, yeah. um and, and obviously you know um we're talking about an unstable profession with uh, um you know people on short uh, short-term contracts yeah. very often often having to work away from home mm. or, or you know issues with accommodation and things like that so mm. uh, as you say archaeologists uh, can be particularly vulnerable um, yeah yeah place rootedness uh, uh, feeling feeling at home feeling as they surrounded by loved ones yeah um, absolutely yeah. and and this this can lead to 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 other related issues whether it's it's uh, uh the perception of an archaeologist in the pub having a, a slightly darker side or you know other other issues but like that so that's right um yeah so it's worthwhile pointing out um 
uh, that 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 is this week and uh, there are some good things happening um earlier this week um wessex archaeology announced that they were going to be releasing a um a mental health um uh, sort of positivity pack which they've uh, they've la- labeled um on the release this morning the heritage feel good pack which will be linking to uh, below and it looks like a lot of fun uh, it's a series of activities that help um help you to feel good and to explore um issues in heritage and artifacts and artifact bi- biographies and this kind of thing um and in some ways it's um this is actually where where we where I slightly contradict or where we slightly contradict ourselves just a little bit because previously we've talked about haven't we how archaeologists and archaeology sometimes oversells the mental health benefits of archaeology yes but actually there is a benefit to to detail orientated work and playing games with ideas and facts and figures and this kind of thing and and sharing this stuff with other people so 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 yeah. again you can use artifacts you can use archaeology to to achieve other therapeutic goals and and i think that's what that's exactly what you know exactly exactly you know, archaeology at its best is a very collegiate activity mm. you you you're working with people you're often working out outdoors in the fresh air and so on which you know give, has a, a certain feel good element everybody you know most people enjoy going out for a walk just to, you know you talk about going out for a walk to clear your head don't you yeah um you know so it's just simple simple things like that mm. I, th- I think the really the important thing to stress though here is you know we talk about mental health awareness week mental health awareness week should really last 52 weeks of the year the yeah. these things these things where we're supporting our own mental health and that of our friends our colleagues our families mm. um it's not something you can ever rest easy on no. uh it's a it's something and, and, and these you know packs and resources and so on are only as good insofar as people actually act on them yeah exactly but 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 uh I think it's a very positive thing to do and to be able to do with friends oh, yeah. and family. So that, that, that's a great thing. It's, it's, um, it's, it's the, fact that we, the fact that we're actually talking about it now, whereas 10 years ago, we might not even have been doing that. That's true. Well, and, you know, uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, and other, I think other people who watch this, this uh, my YouTube channel and listen to these things, know I definitely have um, ups and downs with mental health. And in fact, today, the, today I, was, I was having a, a, a group therapy session before it was interrupted by my neighbors so um so yeah the, the more we, we accept that this is a day-to-day thing it doesn't have to be uh living in in extremis you don't have to be an extreme extra yeah. extrovert or an extreme lonely introvert you can sort of you can you know meet in the middle and then find a healthier way of living is important and and on that note um we've also got a link below to a pdf from the heritage alliance haven't we that's right. It's it's basically it's it's a report uh, called Heritage, Health, and Wellbeing. Um, it, amongst other things, it um, gives background on various um, projects. For example, um, a COVID nineteen lockdown project mm-hmm. uh, from Wessex Archaeology, um, a, a, a Alexander Palace uh, project in Alexander Palace in North London, um, and and. Um, various others so um it, Ooh, it's basically inspiration bell ringing That's really uh, nice it, it, indeed and even a project called the human hinge yeah uh, walking with intent in ancient landscapes it's it's it, it's a really interesting read um hopefully an inspiring read for people who are thinking of what they can do um possibly to initiate projects as well as maybe projects that you know uh, re- organizations that you might want to reach out to as well so um you know, there's projects from historic royal palaces as um as a sensory project there um and um that's for people with dementia and their carers you know so you know it's not just for professional archaeologists it's actually for the public that we serve as well yeah absolutely uh, well at the end of that pdf as you say there are there's a list of further resources um for people to reach out to and get get advice on that stuff and i suppose yeah. it's it's only it's only um responsible to say as well um that uh, we'll put some links below to relevant generalized mental health awareness and and help um organizations it's it's uh, it's important uh, when you discuss these matters to um to remind people that the, the help is immediately available if they need it so we'll put those links below absolutely don't keep it to yourself mm-hmm. there's always someone there to talk to yeah absolutely right well that's a, a watching brief and uh, i think we've actually done it in close to 40 minutes andy i i'm i'm, I'm gobsmacked 
why break the habit of a lifetime? <laughs> um, I, 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 I mean, what is our viewer going to do with the rest of the hour and 15 minutes or so on that we've left them this week? Oh, that's a good question. Maybe what they can do is they can uh, go and donate to Neil Redfern's Walking uh, Across uh, Hadrian's Wall uh, campaign. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we might, we will probably be doing that at some point over the weekend. Um, Certainly so. And, and, and actually, I must just say as well, um, it, that is something I've always fancied doing, walking the wall. Uh, I love Hadrian's Wall. Uh, I've, I've only been able to visit it as a tourist. You're lucky to, you live virtually on it, but yeah, um, it's yeah. a wonderful part of the world. Well, do you know, it, uh, I, I, don't, I can't remember if we covered this in a recent watching brief or not, but there's actually a really important, I think, local movement. Um, and this is where, again, possibly some of these planning developments might come in, come in into uh, into their own. Where local residents um, on the at the let me get this right on the west end, uh, the west end of Newcastle, here on the east end of the wall, um, mm. are, are trying to 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 raise awareness of the fact that Hadrian's Wall actually doesn't go along the the Hadrian's Wall route that's on lots of the maps, especially when you come into Newcastle and towards uh, Segedon and Roman Fort. It actually follows, for the most part, essentially a cycle route that also goes along, I think, the Tyne. And um, it, it's a slightly more picturesque uh, route, but also actually goes through um, some uh, some post-industrial heritage. And it's led to two things. First of all, local people who want people when they're coming into Newcastle, especially off the... Uh, uh, off the, the big stretch of motorway and then they're actually approaching the city proper to follow the line of the wall because you, there actually are chunks of the wall in housing estates all the way along mm. you'll have to sort of you know go around the houses to, to, to see them but they are there to be seen um, they're just not on the official route um, but also as well uh, uh, a friend uh, and uh, sort of local um, colleague uh, is uh, he runs a, a tour company called Red Beer Tours is desperate for people to know when they're in the, on this section of the Hadrian's Wall walk, don't ignore it. Like the number of people who who, who do like a video diary and go, I'm at Sega Dunham. And then they just sort of, dis, you know, the next the next part of their video diary is to skip to all of Wall's End and Newcastle. Actually, there's lots to be seen. There's the old shipyards. There's a, there's a I think he said there's a lemonade factory. There's a, one of the earliest electrical generating, um, there's a uh, proper generators for a whole, you know, the whole town kind of area um for uh, in terms of electrics it's uh, there's the world's oldest wooden railway was uh, well one of the oldest was discovered in the area so um mm -hmm. I, I know i'm slightly rambling and slightly tourist boardy here but it's interesting <laughs> it's interesting on that front where how um uh yeah hadrian's wall is worth walking uh but hopefully um we there'll be more of an awareness that at this end of the wall, it's not a case of rush through Newcastle, get to Segedum and then then go to the pub or whatever. Um, there, there is a lot to see in Newcastle. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I've got to mention it. I can't, I can't not mention it. <laughs> um, no, I, actually, no I, I'd echo that. The, you know, the, the, um, uh, the number of times I've visited the New, Newcastle in the North East and so on, um, and, 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 and Hadrian's all I spent some time on, on bits of the wall on holidays mm -hmm. and things, and I've always been left wanting more. So, yeah. okay. there's something, there's something historically, heritage wise, there's something for everybody, and for a generalist, you're absolutely spoiled for choice. Exactly, exactly. <sighs> Thank you guys for watching. It's been fun. Until next time, do take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>